Long before gospel emerged in Chicago, its roots took hold in fields and plantations across the Deep South. Black music has always been a means by which the early enslaved Africans came to understand themselves as a people, that while they come from various areas on the continent, that they have in common this cultural technology of the ring shout. The ring shout, an African tradition that included elements of sacred dance and prayer to their own gods. They would take a gourd, a big pot, turn it upside down to muffle the sound, and then they would scream and holler their African chants and rhythms till they go into a frenzy and get the spirit. And then they would be all right for a little while. They had some release. They don't speak the same languages, but they have that ritual in common. Oftentimes, the, the slave owners would not allow this worship. You know, they were afraid of it. What are they trying to communicate? So there was a real push to Christianize the enslaved Africans. Slaves were allowed to attend the same church as slave owners, where they learned the hymns of the Church of England. But they took the traditional European hymn and incorporated the ring shout. The result was an entirely new song, the Black Spiritual. When uh, the Africans were creating uh, their music, uh, there was no instruments. Um, they actually um, were forbidden to read and write, and so um, the leader would lead out the song. congregation will listen and sing along. The no song has to be perfect. Everybody singing along. Africans on culture included call and response, improvisations, rhythm, emotion, and those are very important to keep their culture and their spirit together. While the traditional church, with its message of deliverance, was soothing, Black saw the hypocrisy coming from the pulpit. We were creating a new theology, whereas the enslaver was trying to put forth a doctrine, be docile. But yet, people of African descent said, we're going to speak the truth of the stories that we have heard in the Bible, an example is, before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Oh, freedom. Now, the enslaver said, be obedient. But the song says, before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Oh, freedom. There was the white church that they went to, and there was the invisible church that they snuck away to at night in what they called hush arbors, surrounded by trees away from the plantation owners. What becomes spirituals emerges out of the invisible institution. They also have the brilliance to encode the music with instructions in terms of how to flee. The prime example, down by the riverside, to signal that if you want to get away from the dogs, please go down by the riverside. Why? Because God will trouble the water. These biblical stories mixed together 
spoken as a double entendre in order to share freedom and liberation for people of African descent. We never took hold of the idea of being docile and listening to the enslaver. We always had a secret language that came through our music. Blues in the South uh, had a very country feeling. But then you also had this stage blues that came out of the black vaudeville experience. But despite the draw of city nightlife, church was still vital to Southern migrants like Dorsey. African Methodist Episcopal churches had this huge network in which anyone who was looking for employment or housing, those migrants that came, they would know they would be meeting up with a congregation that was gonna welcome them. When Thomas Dorsey came to Chicago, his father was a Baptist minister, so he naturally joined Pilgrim Baptist Church. Pilgrim Baptist was one of six old landmark churches that held prominence in the black community. Worship style at the landmarks mirrored Chicago's white churches. They were called silk stocking churches because the ladies came in silk stockings and in the winter they had furs. There was no hand clapping, no shouting, no hallelujahs. The pastors were really trying to foster a middle-class respectability among their members. The music was anthems and hymns performed by highly trained choirs, and the congregation was not encouraged to join in. Most newcomers found this practice bewildering. Amazing Grace is one of the most popular hymns, but what makes this song unique for Africans is their interpretation of it. Remember, Africans came with their um, emotionalism, and, and the call response is not just the congregation responding musically, but also to the emotion. In the South, the preaching was informal. People sang together, people responded together. So can you imagine a migrant walking into church and expecting to hear communal singing, people hearing a great, good old soul-stirring uh, sermon, and they saw nothing like that. And while old landmark churches supported their new neighbors from the South, most congregants looked down on their country ways. Well, you heard it even in the Chicago Defender. You know, you don't know how to dress, you don't know how to speak. And people took an umbrage to that. People in the margins need a space where they can be fully free, where they can be themselves. And the black church offers an opportunity at its best for people to be free. Not feeling at home in the old churches, migrants sought to create their own. They gathered in homes and revival tents and set up storefront churches along State Street. They brought their own songs with lyrics about the hardships of slavery and Jim Crow and rhythms inspired by the African ring shot. You had the singers, you had the church members, everybody could clap, everybody could sing. When it came to music and, and worship, it was explosive, it was loud, it was spontaneous. When you go into a Pentecostal church, you hear beating. They're gonna stomp with their feet. The mothers are gonna come an hour before church. 
they're going to start praying and singing. So by the time you get there, the spirit is already in the church. That was missing in the large silk stocking churches. Yeah, glory to God.